I just got back from my son's house um, for Mother's Day lunch, which was really nice, even though it's evening now. Um, but I want to say these are earrings that my friend Jeanette gave me. She gave me two pair and I intermix them. For one, Miraculous Metal, and the other there. She's so handy. So, um, we are doing Luke 10 and it's pretty quick. So I thought, let me just do it real quick since I had it ready. So, okay, let's get started. Okay. So here we are. Um, we are still on Luke, Luke in, we're on 10 and it's 11 of 12 biblical periods and 13 of 14 narrative books. So um, studylight.org talks about um, chapter 10 begins a great body of material unique to Luke, comprising some of the most glorious teachings of the Savior delivered to mankind. And I, I love that. And making some of the most interesting writings in sacred scriptures. So I was really excited when I read that. And um, sending forth the 70 um, and their return and then their rejoicing and then the account of the Good Samaritan and then the incident in the home of Martha and Mary. They're all narrated in Luke 10. So the mission of 70. Breakthrough calls it Jesus sends out 72. So um, we ended where, where Jesus told three different would-be followers they were not committed enough. So then he chose 70 more people. Um, but again, yet Breakthrough says 72. Um, and Study Light says some ancient authorities add the two, making this um, 72. And now with Breakthrough over here, um, is it over here? Yeah, over here in Breakthrough, it says two by two. So that's why I wonder if they got it mixed up because it says when you're traveling with a friend and busy talking and visiting, um, doesn't time uh, seem to go by much faster? Jesus knew this, and when he sent his disciples out on a mission, he made sure they went in pairs. He knew that the miles go so much faster when they are shared. He also knew that two people traveling together could support one another through the hard times, and that would certainly happen. Uh, we need each other, um, and that's the way God made us and the way Jesus sends us forth to serve. When a friend is going through hard times or when a family member is sick and needs extra care, those are times when we are called to be good companions. Sometimes a hospital room or a funeral home are the best that we can do and just to just be there. We don't have to say a lot. We can just be a quiet companion. Who are the persons you count on as companions on this road to life? How can you be a companion to someone in your life right now? Um, and that can be just a friend as well, you know? Um, so um, in Great Adventure, um, it says, um, so after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them ahead two by two into every town and placed where he himself was about to come. So he would send them ahead. And he said to them, the, har a har the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves." So he recognizes, you know, it's going to be rough for them. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and salute no one on the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace is there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Because of them, you know, being Jewish, they would want kosher. And he's saying, you know, don't set to those laws. Um, so eat what is set before you heal the sick in a day and say to them the kingdom of god has come near to you but whenever you enter 
a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to your feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it shall be more tolerable on the day for Sodom. Oops, sorry. Sodom. Um, like Sodom and Gomorrah from that town, then for that town. And if you, it says, eat whatever you're served, not worrying about if it's kosher. If you notice, Jesus does not hold to the perfect rule of law um, when it's not perfect and in the circumstances. And this was a Gentile area is what Study Light said um, that they were being sent to. Study Light says, when they refer to wipe the dust off your Feet does not mean an arrogance the way it sounds. It simply means no preacher of the word should consider it his divine mission to nag any man into the kingdom of God. No nagging somebody into saving their soul. That that They have to be ready for that and choose it. And when they talk about the city of Saddam, it says, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable uh, than, Saddam, than in that day for Saddam... The, than for that city. And in that day is a reference to the final judgment, which shall uh, terminate the dispense, dis, dispensation of grace. So right there, it, it um, damns that city. Saddam was a grossly wicked city, it says, whose very name came to be associated with depravity. Um, and then, uh, so, um, when we get into here into woes uh, to unrepentant cities, going a little bit deeper into that, it says Tyre and Sidon and Sidon, Sidon, like Saddam, these cities were considered as most wicked. Um, and it says Chlorazin and Bethesda, see, woe to you, Chlorazin, woe to you, Bethesda, um, for the mighty work done you you had had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in the sackcloth and ashes. Um, but it shall be more tolerable in judgment, um, and you in Capernaum will be exalted to heaven, and you shall be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who do rejects me rejects him who sent me. So what it's saying, the New Testament does not record the mighty works within these cities. It makes no mention of them at all except with the exception exception of a single miracle of healing a blind man in mark 8:22 so it's the most conclusive evidence that only a small fraction of the miracles of jesus are recorded in the new testament chlorazin is mentioned only in one other place in the new testament matthew 11:21 and while Bethesda is mentioned several times as residents of Peter, Andrew, and Philip, only one miracle was done just outside the city. Um, yep, the feeding of 5,000, that was only a few miles from it, but still not in it. So it just shows, you know, that there, there are so many more miracles that, you know, who knows, maybe there's a lost book out there. We never know. Um the return of 70, the symbolic meaning of serpents and scorpions. You see what it says here. Um, they turned back with, they, they returned all these 70 people and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw, see, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are... Kitty, you gotta move your little tootsie. Um, that the spirits are um, subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And the symbolic meaning of the serpents and scorpions mentioned over here... Um, is primarily the works of the devil is what, what it symbolizes. And this is where we are kind of warned of what we all need to be careful, where, where we need to be careful of our ego is what Jesus is saying. Um, 
uh, which of course we know it's the devil's tool. He can whip us around with it, our ego. Um, he loves it when we're into our ego because then we're not, he, we're not worried about serving God. We're worried about looking good. Um, nevertheless, in this rejoice, not that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice not. That is rejoice not in these victories as your own personal triumph is what study light says. It is through you they are victories of the Lord, not you. So just pull that ego right out of there. Names are written in heaven means the names of God's servants are inscribed in the Lamb's book of life. So that was beautiful. I love that. Okay. Um, Jesus rejoices and thanks the Father. Um, in 21... In the same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, it was your gracious will. Um, now, remember, uh, Matthew and Mark say, and what, what's kind of cool about, uh, you know, looking at something, you know, where he's praying directly to God, it's like you are witness to a um, a private conversation almost um, between the Lord and his father. I mean, oh, it's just so beautiful. So now remember, uh, Matthew and Mark say you must enter the kingdom of heaven like a child, meaning innocent. And an infant is a child who hasn't learned anything yet. So when he says... Um, I thank you for, for hiding these things from the wise, um, and revealing them to infants. Um, you know, that means, uh, it, okay. Basically it means that they are, um, children, you know, we we're supposed to enter the kingdom of heaven as child, as a child and as an infant is before they learned. So, it's almost like as an infant, we're learning from Jesus and we enter as a child with open hearts. So when Jesus thanks God for hiding things, he doesn't mean, this is what study light, study light says, it doesn't mean hide his revelation from the wise. They received exactly the same revelation as the infant. They persisted they persistently rejected it. So it was taken away from them and they were permanently confirmed in their spiritual blindness. But what I love is this, he's, he is, this is me, uh, he's thankful for another day to be able to teach things. So he's rejoicing um, that he has another day um, uh, to teach things to others who are willing to hear it. Because he knows his days are numbered, you know, he knows what's about to happen. Um, and also this verse is of incredible importance in showing, and this is what Study Light says, incredible importance in showing those who deny both the divinity of, divinity of Christ and the inspiration of the scriptures isn't from God himself. It's coming from the very person who's denying the divinity, divinity of Christ. And believe it or not, there are some Christians that deny the divinity of Christ. You know, they're not Catholic, obviously. Um, but this this verse clearly shows um, that it's, it's those who deny the divinity of Christ and the inspiration of the scriptures isn't from God itself. Those that people that deny that, they're not being hidden that from God. They're choosing to deny that. So, and then the last part tells them something we all know. These disciples were so blessed to have had the experience. Jesus tells them, first of all, being with Jesus in his days on earth before his crucifixion. And second of all, doing God's work on day one. Wow, what an opportunity they've had. And Jesus is letting them know they are one of the few. You, you're hearing it here first, he's saying. Blessed are the eyes which see what you see. And he's, of course, talking to us as well. So it's both, you know, this trans, trans, uh, um, 
sends time as well. So, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. So, he's talking on both levels. That's what's so amazing about the Bible. Um, So, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test. Teacher, what what shall I do to inherit the eternal life? And he's testing him. It's clear here. Um, It says it. So Jesus comes right back to him and says, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the man answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered right. Do this and you will live. I love how Jesus just always turns it around on the person who's sitting there and testing them. He's just such a master, right? Um, But I guess the man's ego is a little bruised because then he says, it says, but he desiring to justify himself says, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with a nice little parable about the man, a man from going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and left him half dead. By now, by, and then by chance, a priest was going down the road and he saw them and he saw him on the other side. Instead of stopping to help, he went to the other side of the road. But a Samaritan had compassion and went to him, um, bound up his wounds and put on oil and wine and set, um, set him on his own beast, meaning his donkey, I guess, or horse, and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Um, And then the next day, he could have been a cow, though, you know, some of the richer people, you know, had those things. But the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them, that's like a silver coin, and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. Whatever you spend, I will repay you. And when I come back, when I come back, which he asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And the lawyer said the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. That's right over there at the very last one. Um, and so I wanted to show you over here on breakthrough, um, walk right by. Now remember, this is written for kids, but okay. So Have you ever walked into a lunchroom and seen someone eating alone? What is your first reaction? Do you think, thank God that's not me. Do you think about joining him or her, maybe inviting him or her um, to your table? Does it matter whether you know the person or not? Should it matter? Let's not be too quick to judge. The priest and the Levite on the in the Good Samaritan story, they had reasons for not stopping. They may have been afraid to be of being attacked by bandits themselves, or they had contact with blood, it would have made them ritually unclean for a week, according to the Old Testament law. We probably have reasons for walking right by someone we would rather not deal with. But Jesus reminds us that if those reasons, meaning neglecting a person in need, they probably aren't good reasons. We need to remember that somebody we could Someday we could be the one sitting alone. Let's think about the next time we see someone sitting alone. So I like the way they're bringing it down um, uh, to a similar experience that a child might uh, in a child's world. So, you know, I like that they do that. Um, Okay, so Jesus visits Mary, and then we're just going to do 10. We'll stop after this story. Um, do you know what's funny about this Luke uh, 1038? I always thought from the story, it was Martha and Mary, um, Jesus's mother. And it wasn't. And I did rem- I did know that before, but apparently I forgot it because I was reading this book but um, by Joanna Weaver in the Scribed uh, uh, app. Um, having or listening to it in Audible. It's such a good book, and her voice is so soothing and nice. You, you know, it's just, it's a great book. It's called Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World. And 
I've I've been focusing on that lately because my mother and I always talked about that. Um, is the contrast between Mary being more contemplative and Martha being the one to get things done. And um, it's a very common thing if you don't know. But um, So I've been very focused on that. And for some reason, I forgot. Those, these are Lazarus' sisters. Um, and now I remember that. Um, but for some reason, I got it confused. Uh, but Jesus became very close to Lazarus. Um, because it said in study light that he had cast many demons out of Mary. Um, and I don't remember, but in the Joanna Weaver, um, audible book on, um, having a Mary heart in a Martha world, I don't remember her mentioning anything about that, but she wasn't doing as much a historical as she was talking about, um, staying Jesus focused over being so worldly focused. And she talks so much about these two women and their contrast. Um, and that's why I got the book. Um, but I I'm going to suggest you go and get that book. It's free if you're a member of Scribe, which is only eight ninety nine dollars a month. And um, it's S-C-R-I-B-D dot com scribe dot com and it's eight ninety nine a month and there are so many good Catholic books on there and every single one I've looked up um have all been in the membership and I love the Teresa of Avila one on there. Um if you want to know that just ask me on my Facebook. Um so I've never seen one that I've had to buy in all of that. Okay, so basically now as they went their way they entered a village and a woman named Martha received them into her house and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion, which is not to, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, you know, this is a little teeny tiny part, but if you go and listen to having a, um, Martha, um, heart in a Mary's, a Mary's heart in a Martha world, you will get so much from it. So I suggest you go and look at that it's scribed it's i'll put up something on facebook about it um it's just such a great book and the woman's voice is just so smooth uh soothing so okay see you tomorrow happy mother's day